I want you to hit me as hard as you can. Ladies and gentlemen, Bill Hartman. You might remember him from such shows as Saturday Night Live, The Simpsons, and News Radio, and such films as Jingle All the Way and Sergeant Bilko. His legacy stands as one of the most gifted and beloved comedians in television history. A talent of artistic ingenuity and a man of industry-defying humility, he was heralded by his peers and achieved stardom of his own design. But his life and career would tragically end before many of his passion projects could get off the ground. To begin with the murder investigation that has stunned the entertainment world, Phil Hartman, who gained fame on Saturday Night Live, was found shot dead in his home, apparently killed by his wife, who then committed suicide. 35 years after his SNL breakout, we remember Phil Hartman. Stick around, we'll be right back. Philip Edward Hartman was born on September 24, 1948, in Brantford, Ontario. Moving to the United States when he was 10, the Hartmans settled in New England and then eventually California. Hartman constantly sought attention, which isn't easy when you have seven siblings. His natural ability was comedy, which he exercised as a class clown in high school, perfecting multiple dead-on impressions of John Wayne and JFK. But come on, everybody's got a JFK, right? But comedy wasn't meant to be a career path. And so Hartman studied graphic arts at California State University, Northridge, as a means of survival. He did quite well, too, later designing dozens of album covers in the 1970s, including Steely Dan's Asia, Poco's Legend, and America's History, Greatest Hits. Hartman's brother was actually their manager. In addition, he designed the logo for Crosby, Stills, and Nash, a fact that will impress precisely one of your uncles. Hartman's musical ties around this time are undeniable. He even worked as a roadie, once being recruited to handle equipment while Jimi Hendrix performed just feet away. The work of a graphic designer can be a solitary one with long hours of isolation and strict focus. This proved a blessing for Hartman, who used this time to not only create iconic album covers, but hone his voices and create characters. In 1975, the same year that Saturday Night Live premiered, Hartman attended a performance by the Los Angeles-based improv group, The Groundlings. Hartman seized an opportunity to go on stage with the troupe and soon joined the company permanently. During his 11-year tenure, Hartman was renowned not just for his talents, but his commitment and aura. Groundlings co-founder Tracy Newman compared his energy to a hurricane, while fellow Groundlings member John Lovitz recalled, he could do any voice, play any character, make his face look different without makeup. He was king of the Groundlings. Unsurprisingly, Sketch comedy wasn't the most direct path to the babe. Hello, my name is Philip Hartman, and I'd like to introduce you to some of my characters. Mr. Music? Hartman won a 1979 episode of The Dating Game, but was stood up. It was while with the Groundlings that Hartman met Paul Rubens, better known as Pee Wee Herman, and for that other thing. What? We were talking about the spleen. Hartman and Rubens co-developed the bow-tied man-child with talking furniture, spinning him into a character worthy of his own 1980 stage show, which aired the following year on HBO. Hartman played the seafaring Captain Carl, a role he reprised for six episodes of Pee-wee's Playhouse's first season. He even co-wrote 1985's Pee-wee's Big Adventure. While Captain Carl was by far Hartman's most popular character up to that point, 
he still maintained steady voice work throughout the early 80s, playing various roles on the Smurfs, animated Dukes of Hazard series, The Dukes, and Dennis the Menace, playing authoritative and parental figures like Mr. Wilson and Dennis's dad. With improv and voice talents clearly jewels of his comedic arsenal, Hartman auditioned for Saturday Night Live in 1986. His 10-minute audition saw him as Jack Nicholson doing Hamlet, warding off John Lovitz with a toy gun and introducing one of his early trademark characters, Chick Hazard, who is still, for some reason known only to the editors, his main photo on Wikipedia. It was midnight when it happened. I was parked in front of Four Fingers of Bourbon at the Swanee Club on La Brea Avenue. Most ex-flyboys were making babies and buying refrigerators. But in the aftermath of my POW experience, I'd rekindled a relationship with two old pals, Jack Daniels and Jim Beam. Hartman handily landed a spot in the cast and writing team for season 12, the same year Dana Carvey, Kevin Nealon, and Jan Hooks came on. Some much needed talent after the notoriously awful 1985 season with Anthony Michael Hall, Robert Downey Jr., and Randy Quaid. At 38, Hartman was the oldest of the cast, an immediate father figure and commander. His role and significance was immediately aware, earning him the nickname Glue from Jan Hooks. According to SNL showrunner Lorne Michaels, he kind of held the show together. He gave to everybody and demanded very little. He was very low maintenance. But low maintenance didn't mean low output. Hartman had a gallery of 70 plus characters during his time on SNL. He could skew the public perceptions of famous figures like Ed McMahon, Donald Trump, and Bill Clinton, who reportedly got a kick out of the impersonation, but uh, probably not all of the lines. Jim, let me tell you something. There's gonna be a whole bunch of things we don't tell Mrs. Clinton. Fast food is the least of our worries, okay? He also molded iconic recurring characters like the anal retentive chef and unfrozen caveman lawyer. Not to mention... Hartman remains one of the definitive utility players in SNL's history. My greatest strength, he said, is my versatility, even likening himself to Mr. Potato Head. Cock the smile and he's Ronald Reagan. Stiffen the arms and he's Frankenstein. Slouch the shoulders and he's Frank Sinatra. He was a consummate team player and was by all accounts humble. He was like the big brother I always wanted and he was just the nicest guy ever and we became the best of friends. Yeah, like brothers. A very generous person and a very peaceful guy. The hardest thing, he said, was competing against your friends for airtime. It was a privilege for him, said Hooks to play support and do it very well. He was never insulted, no matter how small the role may have been. Hartman's penchant for supporting roles wasn't just fitting for his character types, but also a realistic self-analysis of his place in the industry. Where, really, was the market for unfrozen caveman lawyer, the motion picture? Hang on a second. I I'm sorry, Your Honor, I was listening to the magic voices coming out of this strange modern invention. This has been Unfrozen Caveman Lawyer. It's fun coming in as the second or third lead, he said, quipping. If the movie or TV show bombs, you aren't to blame. He would also state, I wasn't as cute as the leading man, coming from a true middle child. Three years into his stay, Hartman shared an Emmy win for writing. But in the early 90s, things at SNL were changing, with the cast beginning to skew younger as the likes of Chris Farley, Adam Sandler, and David Spade were hired. Hartman expressed interest in departing, but NBC knew they had one of the most talented comedians working and tried to keep him around. Jay Leno reportedly tried to recruit him as a sidekick once he took over The Tonight Show. He must have been impressed by his Ed McMahon. While the studio worked to convince him to stay on SNL for a few more years, with talks of his own variety show, dubbed The Phil Show, labeled a hybrid 
very fast-paced, high-energy show. Hartman agreed to hang on until 1994, likening the experience to trying to escape from the Titanic. By complete coincidence, his final episode shot for his next project, News Radio, was set aboard the doomed ocean liner. What if WNYX wasn't a radio station at all, but rather a massive luxury liner called Titanic? After his eighth and final season on SNL, Hartman signed on to play Bill McNeil on news radio, the pompous, bombastic news anchor at the fictional WNYX epitomized the sort of obnoxious assholes that Hartman had perfected and elevated to a new art form. He compared his everyman abilities to those of Dan Aykroyd, but his egomaniacal know-it-alls were more inspired by fellow SNLer Bill Murray's trademark smarm. Hartman once reflected, I'm the bad guy, the jerky guy. I did all I could to make it interesting. He excelled in this kind of persona, eventually perfecting it into a posthumous Emmy nomination for Outstanding Supporting Actor in a Comedy Series, his only acting Emmy nod. Hartman was a welcome presence in even the smallest of roles, like those in CB4, Coneheads, and So I Married an Axe Murderer, while proving a faithful figure in movies like House Guest, Sergeant Bilko, which he unwittingly foretold in his SNL audition a decade prior. Now listen, Bilko, I've had it with your burlap uniforms. Go get into the official Cotton Army 12. Sir, yes, sir, right, sir. And his finest big screen turn, Jingle All the Way, where he played Arnold Schwarzenegger's eggnog loving, wife groping neighbor, Ted. Mm. Oh, these cookies! I gotta get the recipe from Les. And then there was The Simpsons. During his SNL and news radio days were his stints on The Simpsons, which he appeared on 52 times. No one knows how he got it, and danged if he knows how to use it. <laughs> <laughs> there were various one-off shots, including the memorable song and dance scam artist Lyle Langley in Marge vs. the Monorail. But his recurring characters, ambulance chasing lawyer Lionel Hutz and prolific TV personality Troy McClure, who you might remember from such episodes as A Fish Called Selma and The Simpsons 138th Episode Spectacular, marked some of the finest voice work in animation history. Creator Matt Groening noted that Hartman nailed the joke every time. Troy McClure was Hartman's favorite character and there were even talks to make a live action McClure movie. Unfortunately, this, like far too many, would go unproduced. Included among the well of unrealized projects would be a Chick Hazard picture and Mr. Fix-It, described as Beetlejuice meets Throw Mama from the Train, with Robert Zemeckis producing. There, too, would be a movie alongside Lovitz and a reteaming with Matt Groening, as Hartman was slated to play Zap Brannigan on Futurama, his tragic end would cut out all potential for more Phil Hartman projects. In 1987, as his career had picked up pace, Hartman married his third wife, model and wannabe actress Bren Almdahl. It was by most accounts, under the surface, a marriage bumpy from the get-go, with divorce apparently looming at many turns. The two had two children together, a son and a daughter, and Bren was cited as a wonderful mom. Her issues lied mostly with her husband and substance abuse. Bryn had a jealous streak, at one point violently threatening Hartman's second wife and on another occasion his good friend and SNL co-star Jan Hooks, interestingly considered his work wife. She also disliked her husband's work ethic, a prolific stream of creation that made Hartman a familiar face, voice, and put them in a million dollar home in Encino. She wanted the fame, and even leached her way into Hartman's Saturday Night Live intro, the blonde clamoring for a spotlight but essentially faceless. She would end up with just two credits, an alien on Third Rock from the Sun, and a waitress in 1994's flop, North. Bryn's drug and alcohol abuse also marred their relationship. With two failed marriages, Hartman wanted this one to be different, and even considered putting his career on hold to do so. 
Bryn also cleaned up at one point. This did not last, as Bryn relapsed at a Christmas party when an unnamed C-list actor allegedly reintroduced her to cocaine. In Los Angeles today, the actor and comedian Phil Hartman was shot to death in his own home, apparently by his wife, who then killed herself. They had two children. Police are still trying to figure out exactly what happened, but clearly something went very wrong. On May 28, 1998, as Hartman slept in his bed following a heated argument, Bryn shot him three times with a 38 caliber handgun, twice in the head and once in the chest. Hours later, Bryn turned the gun on herself. Phil Hartman was 49. Reports revealed that Bryn had alcohol, Zoloft, and cocaine in her system, with the alcohol percentage at 0.12%. Among her belongings, police found was a screenplay involving cocaine and a murdered husband that she hoped to make into a major motion picture. It was titled Reckless Abandon. In the season 5 opener of news radio, titled Bill Moves On, the staff of WNYX returns from Bill McNeil's funeral. The show wrote it as a heart attack and read letters left by Bill. Bill Moves On is a raw, emotional episode, and the cast is clearly still mourning the loss of their beloved co-star, having filmed it mere months after his death. Saturday Night Live became unjustly notorious for its supposed curse, with notable alumni like John Belushi and Chris Farley meeting tragic fates. But Hartman's was at the hand of another, at the venom of a loved one, and it resonates as perhaps the most unfair and most wrenching of them all. Following his death, Phil Hartman's ashes were scattered in Emerald Bay off Santa Catalina Island. Tributes poured in. Troy McClure and Lionel Hutz were retired from The Simpsons, while his first posthumous movie, Small Soldiers, was dedicated to him. Campaigns ensured Hartman would have a place on both Canada's Walk of Fame and the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Interestingly, Hartman's last name originally had two ends, but the budding actor and comedian changed it based on a Chinese belief of the destiny number. Losing the extra letter, he learned, indicated the height of artistic fulfillment. While he was never permitted to showcase all he had to offer, his artistic output remains some of the finest and most enduring in comedy television history. The same year of his death, Phil Hartman reflected on his career up to that point. I think in my old age, I've come to realize just how precious everything is and I try to value the many blessings that have been bestowed upon me. I can't imagine a more dignified way to end my eight years on this program. <laughs> goodbye, <laughs> goodbye, <laughs> goodbye. Thank you for watching our show. If you like what you see, please subscribe to our channel, tell your friends who like this sort of content, and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all of our latest videos. We're an independent company and we appreciate all of your support.